blood in my veins. Blue and one eye, red, white, and blue in my brain. I'm a bulldog boy. Okay, welcome back everybody to the Inside the Kennel podcast for 2023. That I've got to welcome the great man himself, Dougie Hawkins. Dougie, how are you? How's life? Paul, how are you? How's 2023 ushering in for you? Yeah, Luke, going along beautifully, Paul. Thank you, Maddie. And um, I'm looking forward to our chat here tonight on this player because he's been one of my favourites uh, to play against. Mm. And the play with, let me just tell you that. And uh, no, everything's going along good, boys. I'm looking forward to this one. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, Dougie, you're talking about the great Terry Wallace. Um, so, you know, obviously a, a champion player at Hawthorne. And, um, you know, before he came to us, I think he uh, he played 250 odd games for the Hawks and um, and then, you know, fantastically crossed over fortuitously um, after sort of a, a very short stint at Richmond. He came to the Dogs in 88 and he played four seasons with us and and you were there for the whole time there Doug tell us a little bit about the plough yeah Matty Paul he, 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 mate, he was a great player make no mistake about that he wasn't a great kick but geez he could find it he could find, <laughs> he could find the footy he wasn't a super kick uh, wasn't great overhead but at, at ground level super had very very good balance very hard to push off the footy uh, and then again Matty Paul he arrived in 88 uh, he won the best and fairest at Charles Sutton Medal. And then I, I reckon in 89, he won it again. I reckon he went back to back. And that was a year that we were going to fold and merge with, with Fitzroy. Yep. So that was all going all over the place the, the night that he won it. I think it was in a nightclub in Carlton somewhere when he was announced as the, as the best and fairest winner. And then I got a feeling Dennis Gallenberti, the CEO, got up and said, oh, the club's in a bit of trouble. We uh, have a big announcement to be made, which we'll hear more about it tomorrow as well. Wow. So the club was going to fold after Terry's come across from Richmond, winning two best and fairest. Um, and then 1990, obviously, Terry Wheeler come along, uh, become the coach. I got the captaincy, which um, Stevie Wallace was back in 89 under Mickey Moldhouse, I reckon yep. that was. So he won two best and fairest under Mick Moldhouse. So that's a pretty good effort by Terry Wallace to come along and do that at that stage of his career. He must have worked so hard. I, I remember seeing pictures of him in the paper with Speedos on down the down the uh, beach like they did in those days where they'd wear budgie smugglers. And he had a magnificent physique and you could see that whatever his deficiencies were, he worked very hard on the things that he was good at, which was particularly his handball, wasn't he? He was one of those great handballers around the time. The same with Diesel William, another very similar player. Yeah, you're right, Paul. He always found his target with his handballs and he was always prepared to get under the pack and win the footy and that sort of stuff. Uh, again, you're right, Paul. He was a fantastic player. He didn't mind strolling around the club rooms in his uh, Speedos, either the old player, with the, with the uh, towel over the shoulder, rolling into the showers. And I remember <laughs> we, we grew up together. We grew up playing against each other. We ended up playing with each other. And, and then, of course, you know, he goes on and becomes a... Uh, and, and you know what? He would have been a premiership coach. He would have been a premiership coach at the Bulldogs. I know I've jumped a little bit from footy straight into this coaching thing, but, um, you know, 97, fair dinkum. If we beat Adelaide, we beat St Kilda. And he's a, pre he's a premiership coach on the back of Charlie Sutton, obviously, now with Luke Beveridge. Um, and and, 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 and we'll let, we'll, we'll let, we, should have, we should have beat. My heart. Have I moved on? Have I moved on yet? <laughs> Oh, you know, if we hadn't have won the 2016 grand final, I would still be having sleepless nights about that day in 97. And, um, you know, we, we'll be talking to Tony Liberatore about his goal behind at some point on this podcast. And, you know, that was, that was a, a you know, a, an horrendous day. But, um, you know, I, I guess, um, you know, plough in the box, I've seen some footage of him. He was, he was just focused that day, even, you know, despite what had happened. Um, did, did he come across as a sort of player who had coaching... Um, sort of pedigree about him as a, as a player. Yeah, I think he did, Matty Paul. I think he really did. He just had that. Um, he just knew the game. He knew the game very well. He communicated with on the field very, very well. He was a very, very good leader, even though he probably didn't captain uh, in his career. Uh, but then again, he had some great captains at Hawthorne, and only had the one year at Richmond, and obviously our 
our club. We had our, our Footscray Western Bulldog captains at that stage. So he was always going to be a coach. He was always a leader. And he, and he got it on the back, I think, of Alan Joyce. Um, I, I reckon they finished last in 96, we did. Yeah, that right? last or second last, wasn't it? But, you know, with Fitzroy sort of challenging us. That's right. Um, we're going to ask him about that because, you know, there was a little bit of controversy how he became, you know, the senior coach there. Um, uh, but, but you know, it was certainly a very controversial time. And, he you know, he, he applied his craft because he was, a you know, a, a really successful reserves coach at that time at Footscray as well. So he was well credentialed um, to, to move into the role. But I guess, um, you know, Alan... Alan Joyce had had, um, you know, a, a bit of a lean season and, um, you know, he, he ended up um, hitting the chopping board, didn't he? he Matt, Matty, he did. He did. And, but, and don't forget, we finished last in 96 and Terry Wallace has gone from last. We probably finished second or third in, in 97. Correct. Is that a fair call? Yeah, yeah we, we were playing off for the... Um, for the uh, top position in the last game of 97. And we just Fair got income. by North Melbourne. So, and that would have been the, the only time in our history to finish minor premier. So, so you know, he, he took us from pretty much the base to the top of the mountain, you know, in, in a 12-month period, as you say. You know that prelim final when Adelaide were coming at us and yes. we're still 25, 26 points up. I was working on Triple M at that stage with Eddie, oh. Sam, Dermot, wow. um, uh, Steve Quartermain, it may have been, maybe Brian Taylor. And, and we were 26 points up, and I, I made the call that Chris Grant needed to go behind the ball oh. to play loose behind the footy. And I'll never forget it, Eddie and Sam and all them. Why would you do that, Dougie? Why would you do that? You're 26 points up. I said, boys, they're coming. That Robert was starting to get a bit of the footy at centre-half forward, and, of course, the great Darren Jarman at full forward. I just felt that we need to chuck Chris Grant behind the footy. So and it was only going to be five or ten minutes, and we know how good Grant he is, the Rolls-Royce. He could have made something out of nothing. Yeah. Then we go 32 points up. Yeah. And and that makes them go wide. They don't come down the corridor. Because if Adelaide want to come down the corridor, guess who's going to get it? The Rolls Royce, Chris Grant. Yeah. Yeah. It was only a five-minute, ten-minute thing. And we and oh. I just reckon that was something that I'm not saying. Here I go. I'm, I, it's something I, just, I would have probably had a look at it anyway. You needed the red phone to the box, did you? Did you yeah, you? I should have rang Paul and said, listen, Plough's a hawk. He would have hung up. Dougie, the, the well, you're Terry's... opening up some wounds there, Doug, and um, <laughs> you know, but uh, but you know, if only we could go back in time and make yeah, a couple of changes, yeah. it may have all been different. But, yeah. but you know what? As we've said before, the weight makes everything so much sweeter. And um, you know, we waited 62 years for for our premiership, and um, yeah. wow, was it good! So let's hope we don't wait as long this time. We're happy for it not to be as sweet as long as we get another one in the uh, in the trophy cabinet, Dougie. 100%. Uh, you know, the plough sort of famous or infamous for his spew um, uh, sermon to the players. was. Did you see, did he have that passion in him? He seems like a very serious character in, in, in the media stuff that I've seen him being interviewed. He's a fantastic media person, by the way. Mm. He, he, you know, he's very honest. He's, he's very particular. But did he have that ability to really just speak from the gut? I mean, that's a classic. It's a classic spray, isn't it, when he speak, when he used the... The, the the spew term. Yeah, make your spew. Yeah, no, he, he 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 wouldn't hold back. He wasn't scared to have what he he wouldn't be scared to say what he wanted to say, boys, as well. And 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 just if we turn the clock back away from that, Paul and Matt, a little bit, I reckon it was one or two years there. He was nearly favourite for the Brownlow medal. I, I, I remember one year he was backed heavily, hmm. and I don't think he polled a vote. I don't think I don't think he polled a vote. <laughs> You can ask him that, boys, when you get him on. But I, I've Thank got a you. gut feeling, and I don't think it was at Footscray. I, I, it may have been, at, obviously, at Hawthorne, but he was backed very heavily late on that Monday, and uh, he didn't poll a vote. <laughs> but one year, I think he finished third or second in one year. Um, but, boy, yeah, going back to, to him, he did. He used to spew. He, and, and when he used to get that word spew, but he used to get that emotional. He'd lose his voice. <laughs> wow. Anyway, he was a fantastic player. Uh, the plough, we called him. Yeah, four times best and fairest in two clubs. Three premierships, I think it is. Um, uh, the rest speaks for itself. And he could have been a premiership coach. So, you know, and probably a Hall of Famer. I'd say he'd be a Hall of Famer, wouldn't he? He's, he's an AFL. Well, he, he, you know, he had 501 games. I don't know if you know that as a player and a coach over all of those <laughs> through his career. So he's an AFL Hall of Famer. Um, but what, you know... It, to be in, to have that much involvement, plus all his media sort of time, his um, his legacy is just enormous. 
great, great player, great bloke. Um, superstar, the player, superstar. Brilliant. Well, I can hear him knocking now, so um, so we got, we got to let him in. We do, we do not keep Terry Wallace waiting. That's one thing I know. Good on you, Dougie. Thanks, mate. Good on you, Paul. Good on you, Matty. Good on you, Paul. Good on you, mate. Good on Okay, thank you very much, Dougie Hawkins. And uh, now we have the great man himself, Terry Wallace, in the house. Terry, how are you today? Yeah, very well, Paul. And uh, look, thanks to Dougie for those uh, those kind words. It's always uh, very pleasing. Yeah. Uh, the whole uh, career is uh, very much in the rearview mirror these days. So it's always nice to just uh, sort of reminisce a little bit. Oh, fantastic. Well, we hope to do that in spades today, Terry. We, we'd like to just start, especially for um, some of the, the um, viewers who maybe didn't get to see you play. How would you describe yourself as a player? Uh, Matty, I suppose if you put it in modern day terms, I was sort of the inside mid, uh, the inside bull, um, who really was the hardball get player, the player who started the process off not always the most glamorous uh going around certainly not the quickest uh going around but uh certainly the one whose responsibility was to get the first use of the ball um quite regularly that meant sharking opposition rucks and trying to you know, pick off where what they were trying to uh to achieve and get us rolling in our direction that was sort of the main aim yeah right so sort of like a modern Day bash and crash Brisbane Lions style, and hence your sort of your nickname, the Plough, I guess. Yeah, I look, I suppose um, if I mentioned somebody, I would have said maybe a Josh Kennedy in Sydney. Um, you know, he's a big unit now, a bit bigger than what I was back in my time, but I was still fairly you know, reasonably strong and big, and big for that era. Um, so it was that type of, of player was my role. And I got the nickname Plough from Russell Green at Hawthorne. Uh, we were training at Glenferry Oval and, you know, the grounds were uh, disgusting back in those days. It was just a quagmire. And I was just ploughing through the mud, you know, getting in, you know, ferrying the ball out, out, out to the others. And uh, he just got to the stage where he sort of said, you just look like a plough churning through a paddock. And uh, hence, that's how I sort of got the nickname. Which is a little ironic, uh, Terry, because Russell Green was a magnificent, smooth footballer, wasn't he? Yeah, well, he uh, he was the one that I was, I was perhaps trying to get it out to so that he could get it and run and make my stuff uh, look good. I, I think uh, very much um, that was the, the way that it was played, that you know, your ruck rover as such was more the run and carry outside player. Rover's a little bit exactly the same where the sentiment was more the you know, in and under and, and get it moving. But, yeah, Russell Green was a, a brilliant player for uh, for our club. Terry, you played in the centre for the young listeners or the young viewers out there. What Explain what the centre looked like back in those days. And uh, We were talking to Ray Walker about back in his day. He was a back pocket and that's all he could play. What was the, what did the centreman do back in the day? Yeah, I, look, I suppose the, the difference is um, no rotation. Uh, so you didn't play any other position. You played your role in your position and you, you didn't leave there and you didn't come off, off the ground either. Uh, in my first year in 1978, I was you know, a teenager. I went into the middle of the ground with Don Scott, Michael Tuck and Lee Matthews were the other three that were in the centre of the ground. Well, I think I played all 22 games and the three finals and the grand final. And I don't think I left the centre square once oh. in the entire year of that, uh, that 1978 season. So that was, that was your role. You were in there and you were responsible for uh, for getting the ball out. And it was such a, a critical part of the game, which it still is, but it was more four of you versus four of them, and it was just a battle head-to-head. -head. And the other thing that I think uh, back in those days was that people actually came along to the football to see those one-on-one -on -one battles. And I can remember when I was a kid, you know, you would actually go and you would know that the two particular players, Cinnamon versus Cinnamon or Rover versus Rover, were going to play on each other. Not like today where, okay, everyone sort of you know, flips and changes or, you know, somebody might, you know, run a tag off one of them. Not that there's that much tagging goes on these days. Then it was me versus Jeff Rains, me versus Merv Nagel, uh, me versus Morris Rioli. And it was very much a one-on-one -on -one game. 
Terry, I do recall coming from the Golden Valley, you made some very kind comments about Chris Conley many years ago. You may not remember it. I certainly do because he was a chef boy, but that's an example of what you're saying here. I think he was coming onto the scene, had a lot of talent. Unfortunately, he was crewed by a by a knee injury, but that's the sort of thing you're talking about? Yeah, I played on Chris uh, quite a few times over the journey, and uh, Melbourne we weren't a strong club at that time, which made it a lot more difficult for Chris, and certainly it was for uh, for me. Uh, at the time, but uh, and I suppose from a maturity point of view, I had a few years on him as, as well. But uh, yeah, look, before he did his knee, he was a fine player and uh, you know, a really challenging uh, direct opponent. I suppose uh, from a Bulldogs point of view, uh, probably the one that challenged me the most over the early part of the journey was Steve Wallace. Uh, the two Wallaces going, uh, going head to head. Uh, when Wally first came down to uh, to the club from Lee and Gatha, I can remember the first time I played on him and uh, I didn't even know who he was because he was just a young kid at the time and uh, come onto the scenes. I think I actually grabbed a footy record at half time and sort of said, I better find out who this guy is because he's given me a little bit of a touch up there. So I need to fight back in the second half. But yeah, we had some good battles along the way as well. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, Wally was a terrific player. I know you had a couple of good battles in 85 with Bill Mayland as well, which we'll hopefully touch on a little bit later. Um, so, look, you know, you, you bounce on the scene in 1978 and you talk about being, you know, in the centre square and not leaving. Not a bad um, debut season to win a premiership there. What was it like, um, you know, to be a part of such an incredible Hawthorne dynasty? Uh, well, the first year was surreal. Uh, there's no other way to put it. I mean, yeah, I was a kid that at 13 years of age couldn't get a game and my local junior football club ended up having to catch two buses uh, from Templestowe to Preston just to continue to, uh, to play junior footy. Uh, then to be not good enough to get into an under-19 system anywhere, go to the VFA, make my own way through the VFA and then all of a sudden to have Hawthorne of all clubs uh, turn around because my VFA club was Camberwell, which was close to Hawthorne, so the Hawthorne boys used to always go up to Campbell to watch. So hence, they saw me playing. And uh, to go from that, where I think it was four to five weeks before the season was about to start in 78, I was at a training session on a Thursday night at Campbell. I had already played two practice games with Campbell in the pre-season, expecting that I was going to be a Campbell player, to get a phone call saying, you're now a Hawthorne player, four weeks later, be in for round one and then to be a premiership player sort of six to eight months later was surreal to say the least but the journey in Hawthorne was yeah fantastic I mean to play in five grand finals and you know if I'd stayed if I stayed I wouldn't have got to the Bulldogs so that's a story for later but uh, if I'd stayed I might have you know, ended up playing in seven or eight um, but I'll take five any day and three premierships any day and uh, yeah it was just a brilliant time such great players um, it was it was a, much, a team where if you did the right things, you were going to get the success because the team was so good. So if you worked hard enough, worked to the right spots, you had so much talent around you that mm. things were going to be all right for you. The other couple of clubs I played with, um, it wasn't always necessarily that way. You, you could do everything right and still not quite get the result that you were looking for. If you did everything right, with the Hawks with that side, you were going to get the result. Terry, how did you manage? I mean, back in those days, I recall that that speed was something that was important as you as we were going from the seventies into the eighties. How did you go from not getting a game as a junior to playing, uh, getting a first round at the Hawthorne in a, in a season that, that produced a premiership? To just go through that mindset about you would have had a lot of obstacles in front of your people saying you can't make it, you're too slow. What was the changing? Who in who? Who sort of inspired you during that period of time? Uh, well, I, I think my dad was the one who kept pushing me the whole time to sort of say, you can do it, you can do it. So I'd say he was the biggest uh, pusher from that point of view. The Camberwell Football Club, to you know, open the doors and give me the opportunity. I won the under nine, it's best and fairest there. My first year there, they put me straight into the senior, senior side the second year. And so that opened the door. So, you know, certainly them as well. But look, I... If I speak to any kids about you know, footy in general, I speak about there are so many parts of the game. Now, we all love it. I mean, I can remember speaking to Mike Sheehan and Mike Sheehan sort of went, I don't really get you as a player. I mean, you know, I come away from games sometimes and someone sort of said you had 38 
touches and I hardly sort of realised that that was the case. And I used to say to Mike, there are so many types of players. Now, Mike liked the pure player, the purest. Uh, Keith Gregg or Robert Flower on a wing you know, loved Dougie Hawkins. Um, those sort of players because they were majestical, magic, pure footballers. But you didn't have to be a majestical, magical, pure player to actually be able to make a grade and, and make you know, a career out of, out of footy. And that was my point was, uh, let's say there's 50 points that you need to touch on a football field, different areas, whether it be endurance, uh, whether it be one touch player, whether it be reading the play, I could go on and on and on and on and on. Well, I went, well, if I have enough of these that I cover off and do very, very well, I still think I could have a really good career, even though there are a few of the things that I can't do so well. So it was just a matter of building up enough of it. I built up a base of fitness, which was at the time more than what most players in the 80s were doing. I went full time. I actually stopped working and went full time. I was doing maybe four to four hours before training. Um, so I was going to the gym, doing um, fitness work, like running in the water. Um, so you know, really pushing yourself, doing 400s, but not you know on your on your legs the whole time. So doing that um, within the, with a, a vest on and doing it in the water, but working your heart, lungs. Uh, fitness wise, uh, gym wise, I was as big and strong as what I could possibly uh, get myself. I really prided myself in being a one touch player and not fumbling uh, the ball. I thought that was really important. That even if I got to it. Uh, maybe some others might have been able to get there first, but my ability you know, for myself to be able to go, okay, if I ever run it, bang, it's gone, it's hidden the other direction. So all, just all the little things, just ticking the boxes of all those little things, I think so important. And as I said, that's why I like to tell a lot of uh, young players, you know, don't always look at what you can't do. Your weapons are the things that, gets you to be the footballer that you are. It's not the things that you can't do that sometimes they can stop you, yes, but most of the times it's the weapons that you built that will actually make you the player or not. Yeah, that's that sounds so awesome. And what a great advertisement is for hard work as well as using your, you know, your weaponry also. We we did we did talk to um Ray Walker, who was one of the um the Victorian selectors, and he said very early on in the piece when you came along, it was really apparent that your work ethic was just, you know, top notch. And, and, and that um, that appetite to, to better yourself was, you know, really fundamental for your success. Would you you would clearly agree with that? Well, I had a little bit of a point to prove by the time I got to the Bulldogs as well, because it's, it's funny how life works. I mean, you know, I played in the premierships at Hawthorne, three of them. I won a couple of best and fairest. And, you know, it's hard to win a best and fairest when you're up against Lee Matthews trying try to uh, try to win them. I mean, he won about seven of them. But uh, so you're up against really good players that you were able to sort of achieve that. But the moment that I left and I didn't do any good the next year and I was set for failure just with the way it was set up at, at Richmond uh, the following year, I didn't get there till a month into the season, hence was you know, some of the dealings that was going on between Hawthorne and Richmond and I was underdone, I hadn't done any pre-season training, so that was set up for failure mm. but the whole critique of it was, he's only any good with good players around him mm. so mm. by the time I got to the Bulldogs, it was Point to prove. Uh, this is not this is not going to be the way that I'm going to be remembered as you know, yeah. I only could play because I had good players around me. So I, I did get to the Bulldogs with a fair sting in the uh, in the tail and a fair bit to sort of want to prove. So uh, the, the work ethic, the things that I, I'd done at Hawthorne with the pre-season back you know, in tow and being able to get some continuity football once I got to the Dogs, you know, I, you know there was a bit to prove. Perry, what, how did you cope with that year? I mean, you've come from a very successful football club. You've got particularly high standards. You go to a football club where that doesn't happen. Firstly, how did you cope uh, personally with that professionally? Because you go back to Richmond, of course, years later as a, as a coach, which I want to just explore a bit later. But how did you cope with that year before you went to the Bulldogs? Not well. <laughs> I think like, I think anyone that's had you know, a relatively successful period of time and mine was nine years at, at Hawthorne um, and then have it all come crashing down and it 
turning into a disaster when you've made a made a move. That's not easy to accept. And uh, as I did mention, I mean, I, I thought that there were there were reasons behind why that happened, but uh, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it was what it was at the time. I had signed sort of a you know a mid to long term contract with Richmond, so all I was wanting to do after that season of debacle, and I didn't play for the last maybe eight weeks, nine weeks of the year with an injury because uh, all I've been doing was running roads for, for six or seven months and, um, you know, my body sort of packed up a little bit and uh, all I wanted to do was get back to pre-season with Richmond and go again. But uh, from a Tigers point of view, that was uh, save the skins time and the club was broke and I got there through a contract that was signed by Alan Bond Alan Bond was there for five minutes and out, and out the door. And so Richmond was stuck with a contract that pretty much they couldn't afford. And it, it got it got murky and it got pretty, pretty, uh, not ugly, but just frustrating. You know, they had me training with you know, a group of under-19s and tryout players because uh, they were trying to get me to jump ship from a contract because they didn't want to, pay out the contract and eventually I just went to them and sort of said look this is no good for you and it's no good for me and we ended up just a handshake I said I'll step away from the contract I don't care about the contract I want to play footy and uh, so a handshake that we stepped away from the contract uh, I went I was fortunate enough that I went that summer to the Bicentennial Carnival which just happened to fall uh, at the time between me leaving Richmond and prior to getting to the uh, to the Bulldogs and went over to Adelaide and played in the Bicentennial Carnival with the VFA of all things because for those that weren't around the Bicentennial, there was two divisions. One division was your typical WA, South Australia, um, Victoria, I think New South Wales might have been in uh, Division 1, a uh, combined sort of New South Wales team. Division 2 was Queensland, Tassie, uh, the VFA, the VAFA, um, and a couple of others on Northern Territory. Um, and what it was, it was a place of origin. So wherever you started, you could go back and, and play for them. So obviously we had, um, I think Barry Round was uh, running around with us. Alan Izzard was running around with the VFA, Wayne Johnson, myself. So we had quite a good side. You, know, you had Rodney Ede running around with Tasmania. Jason Dunstall was playing for Queensland. So it was a you know, a carnival of origin. And uh, so, again, I had a bit of a point to prove and I went over there and ended up winning the second division medal. And that's when the Bulldogs went, well, surely he's good enough to be still playing in the competition. He's been playing against Dunstall and Ead and, you know, uh, Michael Long and won the medal for the, uh, the best at the carnival. So they ended up also... Uh, Probably at the time I was fortunate, the Bulldogs weren't, but they had a couple of niggly injuries to uh, Steve Wallace and Michael McLean. So two of their midfielders. So all of a sudden they were a bit light on the midfield and I got the call up from Dennis Gallenberti, who I'd been with at Hawthorne many years prior. And uh, Dennis sort of said, well, you know, where, where are you at? And I said, I just want to play. And so virtually we come to an agreement where I played virtually for match payments but if I achieved certain goals, I could I could earn the money, but I had to prove that I, I could, it wasn't going to be a guaranteed uh, money earner for me. I had to go back to square one to be able to do it, which I was happy to do. Wow. Isn't that incredible then? So, you know, a dual best and fairest in, you know, an incredible era at Hawthorne, three premierships, you come across, there's still question marks hovering over your head and you come to a battling club and paying for match payments. You know, it's, it's that's an incredible tale. And then... You know, you just blew up with with um, you know dual best and fairest upon your arrival. Can you talk us through the arrival at the Dogs? And did you have any sort of preconceptions of what the club was like? You know, did you, were you seen as battlers? Were you coming in just sort of saying how are we going to change the culture? What what um, you know what was it? What was your perceptions and what what um, what I guess um, contradicted that and maybe what was um, what was actually true? So uh, the first thing I'll say is I uh, I didn't have what some people have of the uh, western suburbs is in the only time they go over is the westgate you know, go over the westgate bridge if they're going down to the beaches down at geelong i didn't have that mental attitude because my folks had owned a uh, a milk bar in altona 
hmm. in the, uh, the in the very very early days, and uh, I was babysat by Charlie Sutton's sister, um, who just lived about five doors five doors up the road. So uh, there was a little bit of that dog's history that was floating around from a very 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 young age, which I was reminded of quite regularly. You know, as I was yeah, as when I was a kid, so I didn't have the you know the the, the mm. situation of oh, bulldogs. Why? What, who who would want to go there? Because I sort of had a bit of a love for Charlie and you know, a bit of a love for my early years uh, being down in the West. So that was okay. That was uh, no real drama. I got to the club on the Thursday night of round one of the '88 season. So I had run one hour session with the boys i can oh. remember on the saturday we played uh sydney out at waverley so you imagine these days you have hardly met any of the players you've had one one hour session you are selected straight into the into the side for the saturday game uh, you play i got my wife to drive to waverley because i sat in the passenger seat with the team photo just trying to make sure that I remembered all the names that I possibly could. So obviously I knew Rick Kennedy and I knew Steve Wallace and I knew Dougie and I knew uh, Brian Royal. That was all pretty easy. But when it was starting to get down, uh, Angelo Petrino and, uh, and Dick, Dickie Cousins and, and a few of those, that was sort of you know, testing me out a little bit back at the time. So uh, I, did, I did my homework as much as I could on the way to the ground and uh, we had a win that first uh, that first game. I went okay from the first first game in, um, considering the circumstances. And well, we hang on, you went better than okay, Terry. You got thirty touches that day, and you were pretty much um, touted as best on ground. I know Richard Cousins, who you mentioned, got the three Brownlow votes. You probably robbed on that day, and I think Glenn <laughs> Coleman got the one and Shields too. So you didn't get. In fact, I don't think you got a Brownlow vote in '88, despite being one of the favourites and a best and fairest. So I think maybe the umpires were seeing something different um, than, than we saw, but um, you had an incredible game that day. Well, look, it was, a, it was a nice start. It was just a nice start because all of a sudden, you know, you're in and you, you're sitting there. Um, the guys sort of uh, see that you're there for the right reasons and, uh, you know, you, you're going to potentially help them. Um, by that stage, I was a very senior player as well. So, you know, some of those... Uh, you know, those younger guys, Alara and Dickie Cousins, who were still really you know, quite a, a young ruckman at that sort of stage, you could work with them and uh, and try to assist them and, uh, you know, and be able to help in, in that manner. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we then got to round two and things didn't go quite the way I was expecting them to in round two. Yeah, can you talk us through that first quarter and your old mate Rod Grinter and, um, and what unfolded there? Well... Yeah, what unfolded was uh, I think I left half my mouth still sitting out there in the in the Whitten Oval or the Western Oval as it was at the uh, at the time. So uh, yeah, kick out from uh, from Greg Eppleston uh, uh, towards the, the grandstand side of the ground. Uh, I've gone running sort of sideways, so I'm running towards the grandstand to to take a ball sideways. Uh, did not have any idea that uh, Rodney Grinner was coming sort of off a halfback flank centre wing, uh, coming the other direction. Uh, he's taken a round arm uh, swipe and yeah, it got me straight across the uh, the jaw and the uh, and the teeth. Unfortunately, back in those days, you didn't have to uh, have a situation whereby you had any casts or anything like that that you're wearing you didn't have to get them approved by the AFL or the umpires prior to a game right. and unfortunately he was wearing a plaster cast on a hand that he had had a problem with so it was like getting hit with a rock straight through the uh, through the front of my mouth and I remember going down I, I, was, I was sort of dazed clearly but uh, I was enough with it to know what was going on. And my initial reaction was I thought I'd bitten my tongue off, mm. uh, which is not a particularly pleasant uh, thing to be thinking. But what had happened was the whole of my jaw from here down to there, so the whole teeth and jaw had collapsed. So the mandible had collapsed and was sitting 
face on down onto my tongue. So I couldn't move my tongue because the mandible and the whole jaw was uh, lying on my tongue. That disintegrated my bottom lip virtually completely, um, knocked out my front two teeth. Um, I had like uh, cuts and abrasions all all across uh, my, my face or my mouth. And uh, the funny one for me, I've had a laugh about it on social media a couple of times is I can always remember having a look at a replay and the first person on the scene was Mark Cullen. And Mark's, you know, Pick basically got me, picked me up, and then looked at my face and dropped me. He actually just dropped me back onto the onto the ground. He got such a fright with wow. what he what he'd actually uh, just seen. And uh, yeah, I was I was a real mess. I was a real mess. So, Harry, did, did you have a just quickly? You had a mouth guard on, no doubt. No. Oh, you, wow. <laughs> never, never wore a mouth guard. Wow. In my life. Still round three. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But uh, no, no, so I, I was a non-mouth guard. I, I like to be like verbal in the game and wow. you know, alive in the light. And I always found that they uh, they restricted uh, that. So I played without a mouth guard. I played without strapping on the, my ankles without a mouth guard all my career at Hawthorne. Uh, never, ever had either. Terry, so, I guess that uh, that wouldn't have made much difference by the sounds of it. Quick question, Terry. I, I was talking to Maddie before we started around the, the, that era you played in where you, know, you see things on Facebook and YouTube about the glorification of knocking people out, you know, um, you know the demonstrative behaviour towards umpires. There was, you know, you, you've just mentioned a few things about playing your first game at the Bulls in unusual circumstances. There were some great things that happened back in the day, but the, the different changes that have, or the more positive changes that have happened since then, is, it, is the game better for it? Or what are, you, what are your views on that? 100%. I'm a... Uh... Yeah, I sit back and have a look at some of my teammates over a period of time and sort of say like, how they were allowed to get away with some of the things that they got away with and how they were allowed to play. In fact, the following week, to mm. me, is, uh, you know, well, in today's, I mean, they would be out for a month or more. Um, but, yeah, I was a ball player. I, uh, I reckon I went to the tribunal 16 times once when I was up and happened to be uh, against Jimmy Edmund. <laughs> so it was, okay. it was a Hawthorne game against the Bulldogs. Once when I was up and I got a severe reprimand, um, 15 times where I was the one getting hit. Uh, I just sit there and I still don't like the glorification of the old boys that belted blokes. And you see it on social media all the time, you know, on the fan websites and that, oh, we love him. You know, he used to give it to this one and give it to that one. Will you be on the end of some of that sort of stuff and see how it how it goes? I mean, uh, my Saturday night was reconstructive surgery after that round two game. My Sunday was plastic surgery on my lips. My Tuesday was dental surgery because I had to have every single one of the uh, nerves removed out of all the bo my bottom teeth um, and had to get upper and lower mouth guards made. Um, all that included, I think it was about 50 odd stitches inside and, inside and out. Um, to me, that's not what footy is about, not, not, nor what it should be about. And uh, the game's much better for that not being a part of it. Yeah, well said. I was in the John Jen stand when that happened and we were we were just blown away and shocked, you know, when that had happened because it was just, it was a huge left left hook that came at you. So, you know, as we say, the game's better for it. And look, you returned very, very soon after that for memory. I think, you know, that'd probably keep players out for six or eight weeks, I would have thought. But am I right in saying you returned maybe two weeks later? Well, the conundrum for me was that they'd sort of said that with all the wiring and everything that I had in and plates that I had in, that I had to either take eight weeks off or just keep going. I mean, that was you know, no other choices. So I actually played the following week. And uh, so I, I we played Fitzroy the following week. Um, I still had all the stitches in my mouth. Uh, put the double mouth guards in over the top. So they had to be placed in over the top of the all the guards and everything that I uh, that I wore and marched out to play against Fitzroy and 
I think Robert Walls was coaching Fitzroy at, at the time, and he sort of said, well, if he's fit enough to play, he's fit enough to be oh, fair no. game. I remember going for the ball the first time where it spilled out of the middle, and I picked the ball up, and I seen his elbow come flying through we were just across the point of my nose. Uh, Ross Lyon just missed me. Oh. <laughs> he just, just missed uh, you know, getting hold of me, but uh, I actually uh, went on and got the three Brownlow votes that next week. So uh, I did get Brownlow votes that year. It was a year after that I didn't get any um, right. around the around the way, but uh, yeah, got the three Brownlow votes. My point was that if I was going to prove to the Bulldogs people that I was going to be there for the right reason and the players, the coaches, but the supporters as much as anything, mm. that was my moment. That yeah. was the moment that I had to... I had to go back out. If I missed eight weeks after missing with all the debate about, you know, only playing well against, you know, with the good Hawthorne players, not performing at Richmond, if I'd missed eight weeks of that year, I think my, in my own mind, my career was over. So I had to get back out there and prove a point to everyone that I was there for the right reasons. Terry, you put, you're certainly putting your long-term health at risk there. Do you regret that or is that a decision, a risk you took that worked out well for you? I don't regret it. Um, it, was, it was risky. There's no doubt that it was risky. If I had got a knock on it, all the world would have caved in again. And then you've got to go through the, the whole process and how much worse is it the second time around. Uh, you were speaking about Ray Walker before. I remember very, very vividly Ray, who was the chairman of the match committee for, for us then, ringing me on the Friday night and saying, mate, you don't have to do this. Um, we realise, you know, you're doing everything, you know, trying to do the right thing by us and uh, by the, your teammates, but you don't have to do it. I, I said, Ray, I, in my mind, I do have to do it. And uh, I think that set up my, my time at the Bulldogs. And I think it helped re-establish me as a football person who is in football for the right reasons. Yeah. And, you know, for people sitting at home and listening to that and, you know, it's very easy to be critical when you're sitting in the grand centre watching at TV of, you know, players and how, how their conduct is and how hard they are at the ball. But just hearing that story, just the fact that you got up with, you, you know, half your bottom jaw collapsed and got up and were able to get off the field to return is phenomenal. So, you know, what an incredible achievement. You certainly have the respect of, you know, of all Bulldog supporters. Talk us through a little bit about some of your, your teammates at this time of sort of who stood out to you as being, you know, fantastic teammates and, and great players in this era. Oh, certainly uh, when I first arrived at the Bulldogs, I, I thought that there were two absolute standouts um, at, the, at the Doggies at the time. And that was Doug Hawkins, obviously, with his class and just the, the way that he went about it. And, uh, and Brian Royal, uh, Doug had, had had the knee injury by that sort of stage and was just still sort of coming to grips and coming to terms to yeah, getting back to playing his absolute uh, best footy. But uh, uh, I thought Brian Royal was just the, the real standout when I, I first arrived. You know, I obviously had seen him in state games and played with him uh, in, in state games. But you know, on arrival, you know, he was just, an absolute uh, bulldozer, and whether that's you know, extracting the ball out of the middle of the ground, or you know his ability to be able to go forward and you know mark for his size. I, mean, I think you know uh, down in country footy, he played centre half forward at times. You know at Rover, Rover height, and uh, uh, he was just absolutely dynamic. But there was more than those. I mean, Stephen Wallace was a you know a really good player. I spoke about how good he was. Uh, Magic McLean, very very underrated. Thought yeah, he's uh, natural abilities, such a, a smooth moving uh, footballer. Rick Kennedy as the as the leader and the you know the real strength uh, down back. Um, when we had him in the side, he might have missed a few with suspension on me on the journey, Rick, but when we had him in the side, you always thought you were a chance of getting the result your way. When he was missing, you noticed a, a big gap in what was being able to be achieved. Peter Foster uh, was another one that I would sort of say was right up there, whether it was set up forward or set up back, can play at both ends of the ground. Uh, Tony McGuinness, um, he was my Russell Green when I got to the Bulldogs. Uh, the bloke that I knew that I could give it to that would make my work look better. And we had a little uh, little arrangement, me and uh, Macca, towards the uh, 
you know, the end of uh, my time there, and that was the old one-two. So, so every time you get the ball, give it to me. Uh, I'll give it straight back to you and get the block in and be able to sort of you know, give you some room to be able to, to be able to work. So I'll do the grunt, you do the outside run and, run and carry, and I think we'll be a good little combination together. So there, there's a few. Uh, I could not leave out Simon Beasley either. I, I thought Simon, well, I mean, Bulldogs people will know this. Outside of Bulldogs, people don't know. Simon Beasley kicked the most goals of any single player in the competition in the 1980s. And I, I think there's a lot of people who don't actually realise that, that that's the case. He didn't look tough at all, but was one of the tough full forwards who was prepared to back himself back into a pack to be able to hold his ground to uh, to mark. He was a, a fine player. So there's, you know, seven or eight sort of going off straight from there. Uh, that's brilliant. We actually interviewed Simon um, a couple of weeks ago. And I'll tell you what, he knew that stat, Terry. <laughs> I'm sure he did. I saw him knew most stats and uh, he knew how to uh, get a little bit of money off the boys with a little bit of bookmaking that used to go on on the side as well. Yeah. Terry, you sort of answered that question before you were saying who responded to you when you when you when you were at the Bulldogs. How long did were you sort of the were you the general in a sense when you were in that center position and did the team accept you in that role or how long did it take for them to get used to your experience and your your style of play? I think it happened pretty quickly because you know, I was reasonably chirpy. Um, I, I was not a mouther like to umpires or anything like that. Uh, I wasn't a mouther. I never spoke to my opponents, but to my teammates at organisation and, and trying to get things set up. I had a basketball background. Uh, you know, went to America as a youngster, played state basketball and, uh, you know, the point guard was the organiser. He was the, the, the person that set everything up for uh, for the other players. And so I saw that as my role, you know, even when I was in with Tuck Matthews and Scott you know, back as a teenager. So I think that just came naturally to me. And when it comes naturally to you, it comes naturally to the boys around you. So I don't think that that took very long at all, the, you know, two or three weeks and, and knowing that I was there. Uh, for the right purposes, and uh, and I think that, that that gelled pretty quickly. Yeah, wonderful. And eighty eight and eighty nine were fantastic years for you. Um, how does it feel to be a um, you know a back to back Charles Sutton medal winner? Winning a best and fairest at under tens levels at any competition anywhere along the journey is hard enough to do. And, you know, we spoke about some of those players that were just reeled off uh, reeled off there. Mm. Um, to be able to win a best and fairest was an honour. To be able to win two in a row was an enormous honour. And, uh, you know, the club was struggling in that second year, that 1989 year. And I think my seniority allowed me to focus on just you've got to get your job done week in, week in, week out, where I think a few others sort of lost their way. Who's going to be coach? What's happening here and there and, uh, and all around the place? And... Uh, we dropped away a bit in the second half of the year and I think I was, I suppose, a little bit more senior experience just to be able to grind it out a bit more and um, yeah, to be able to get that second second B and F. And uh, I sort of won it much more comfortably than what I won the first one. I, I think I might have been Choco by one vote in the, uh, in the 88 one. But uh, I've got to thank Mick Molehouse for a lot of that. I mean, Mick gave me that opportunity. It was Dennis that picked up the phone, but it was Mick that runs the club and uh, you have to have the faith in being able to bring you straight in um, and play you right from the, uh, right from the outset. And I won both of my best and fairest under Mick. And then he moved on at the end of the 89 year. And uh, uh, so I'm very, very appreciative and thankful to everything that Mick did for the Bulldogs because gee, he was a damn good coach for the Bulldogs. I mean, at 85 year, I mean, I know a lot of doggies people think that if they had got to Essendon, they always, you know, went pretty well against the uh, the Bombers, but uh, you know, we got them in, in the prelim final. But Mick took them from nothing to you know an amazing season, and uh, yeah, he was an extremely good coach for me. Terry, you were coached by Jeans, Parkin, Malthouse, and Wheeler. What did you learn from those guys? Who had the most impact on you? And I guess Terry Wheeler is a little of the odd one out there. Probably didn't go on to have a great career as a coach, but. Another question, what sort of impact did he have on you? I'll go wheels first then. Um, 
yeah, had a great impact on me. He was a lateral thinker of the game. He, he looked at the game a lot differently than the other coaches that I'd had. Uh, he was probably one of the first coaches that I saw that was looking at uh, the holistic part of the game. Uh, so not just the one-on-one -on -one aspects of how the game was uh, being played up to then. So uh, setting up players that if you get the ball, this is your outlet, this is who you go to uh, you know, possess the ball off to and uh, structuring up you know, three and four lines of, of play, which you know, was almost unheard of at the time. So that was good. But then also I got the opportunity of being an assistant coach under him as well. So I, I sort of got the dual side of it, having him as a coach and then having him, uh, you know, well, me learning a bit of coaching craft off him as well. And we, uh, we sort of say that he, uh, you know, he didn't go on to have the greatest record of all time. When you actually have a look at his win-loss record, it's, pretty damn good. I think he's about number four for Footscray, for Footscray coaches. And I still sit back. I was in a match committee meeting the, the night that he got uh, the heave-ho, and we thought he was just going to you know, speak to the, the board about something that was going on. And we sat in this match committee room for about three hours waiting for him to come back, and he never ever came back, and uh, the rest was history. But that year we were one and one. We were one and one, and he got the sack from his uh, from his job. So I thought he was very very unlucky. Uh, the other three uh, gentlemen that were involved, David Parker was my first coach. Uh, when you're a kid and you don't really know anything about, about VFL AFL football, you learn so much off him. He was a school teacher, so he was a teacher of people. Uh, he was into dossiers before anyone knew about dossiers. He was into um, opposition analysis and, and watching video of opposition play. So it was a great learning curve for me. Alan Jeans was the enforcer, the senior sergeant of the police force, uh, a shrewd operator who really knew his, uh, who knew his business. I probably played my best football under Alan, uh, but I uh, had debate with Alan and, uh, and didn't always see eye to eye uh, with Alan al along the journey. So, um, that had its highs and it had its lows along the journey, which so many you know, player-coach relationships have had over a, a long period of time. But you learn something off every single person that you're involved with. And uh, you know, if you don't, you're foolish, foolish not to because they didn't get to those jobs or those positions without doing a heck of a lot right along the journey. There were hundreds that would have liked to be in their shoes. They were the ones that managed to be able to get there. So if you don't learn off that sort of person, you're crazy. Yeah, well said, Terry. Thank you. And and just getting back to um, the end of 89, so I guess, um, you know, Mick Malthouse probably would have been um, at the best and fairest announcing, you know, you your victory. And um, then there was uh, the, the, the big bombshell because it was probably, you know, at the very end of September or early October and, and um, the announcement came through, I, I understand, on that particular evening that um, the likelihood was that we were going to fold or merge. Is that is that correct? That's absolutely correct. We're in a nightclub in Carlton, which has been locked up since the Sunday night. The uh, the carpet squelched, the, the place stunk. But, um, you know, and there, it was the best and fairest. I mean, the club were broke at that stage. I think we uh, had the next ones at Toto's Pizza Parlour in Ligon Street just down the <laughs> down the road so the club's come a long way from those days uh, but yeah that particular night they virtually announced the best and fairest i gave my speech and then uh, so that was a monday night and dennis Birdie uh came on and said that uh the, the press the, the first releases of the press were just coming out and that uh for everyone in the room that they uh, need to be aware that the club would be merging with fitzroy uh, for the following season. And it was like, okay, well, what do I do with the BNF? Where does that sit? What's the history of the club? Is it going to be Fitzroy's history? Is it going to be the Bulldogs' history? So it was, it was very, very surreal. Uh, a night that you wanted to cherish in one way, but a shock that just sent shockwaves through the whole footy club. Yeah, incredible. So how how were we able to bounce back? Obviously, we know the history that, um, you know, the the fans rallied and we, we were able to, to you know, to, to stand on our own two feet and, and survive. 
how was it running out on that field for the very first time in, in 1990, knowing that um, it's fresh beginnings? What was that like? Yeah, well, it, once we realised that the club was going to survive, and I, I've got to sort of say that I wasn't at the rally. Uh, I had a fair reason why I wasn't there. I got married on Friday and was in uh, was in America uh, when the when the rally was held. So I uh, I missed a lot of that. Followed every single second, everything I could get my hands on from over in the US um, at, at the time. But uh, once we realised, and I was. Yeah, in regular contact with teammates and, and things to sort of see how everything was going. But once we realised that we were actually going to make it, I think that was where the major relief came. And then it was, okay, well, you know, let's roll up the sleeves and get into this. I think the first game, we, uh, I think we got beaten very, very comfortably in the, in the first game we played. I think it became a little bit overwhelming that we almost felt like we owed Everyone, every supporter that put in, uh, you know, uh, any sort of you know, a dollar of 20 cents, whatever it was, gave up their time. Uh, I think the whole playing group felt that, like they owed everything. And it can, it can happen sometimes where you just get overwhelmed by an occasion that becomes too big. And I think uh, that initial time it did. And then we just settled and started getting on with playing football and everything sort of, you know, turned around. You know, reasonably quickly and you have a look I mean you know, the club looked like it was down on its knees but then you go through the 1990s and you know, we had some wonderful players uh, Chris Grant come in as a, as a youngster Leon Cameron come into the football club as a youngster but uh, it turned very quickly and the 90s were actually you know a really quite a successful period of time had a few ups and downs in there but quite a successful time for the footy club so to think that this mm -hmm. club that you know, we're uh, playing in finals quite regularly over the sort of the mid to late 90s might have not been in existence. It's really, it's, I mean, it's ludicrous when you look at back at it now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, 89, you're on your knees. And in, in that next decade that you talk about, we made the finals, you know, six times and three as, you know, yeah. you as coach um, there as well. So, so you know, the twilight of your career then, you know, obviously 1990 and 1991 um, came around. Um, how was the um, the end of your playing career? And um, and how did that, you know, how did that finish for you? Uh, probably finished a little disappointing, but I mean, most most people's careers do in, in, when it comes to the crunch. I mean, uh, yeah, you get to the stage where, yeah, you want to go on and you, you think things are going to last uh, a little bit longer. Uh, 1990 had a really good year. Um, the, the old World of Sport, I won their award for the Player of the Year on World of Sport. I came in the, uh, the top three of our best and fairest again. Uh, I think the uh, the um, the AFL had a top nine of 1990 because uh, obviously 1990 they picked nine rather than the top ten players. I was in their top nine for, uh, for the season, as was Tony McGuinness. Um, so I'd had a really good year. I played my 250th game, uh, second last game of the season. I found out now that it should have been the last game of the season that the uh, the cheer squad got it wrong, and so I had to my batter for the uh, for the game at Windy Hill where it should have been at the Whitman Oval. Uh, I found out <laughs> all these years later, probably 15, 20 years afterwards, that that actually was the case. Uh, but so I played my 250th game. I came off the 1990 season at 250 games thinking I'd play 300. Mm -hmm. uh, 1991, everything that could have gone wrong in the summer went wrong. I had knee problems after knee problems, just could not get on the track. Uh, you know, missed virtually all the practice games, tried to get in at the start of the season, wasn't right. Played four or five more games. And I walked into Terry Wheeler one Monday after hobbling around at home, well, it would have been around round six or seven, hobbled around home on a Monday, and I just went into Terry and sort of said, look, you've got Simon Atkins in the middle. I mean, I'd done a lot of tutelage with, with Simon to make sure that he was right. He was a good enough player in his own right to do it his own way. But uh, you know, the responsibility of a senior player is to make sure that, that guy is ready to, uh, to take your spot. Uh, we were playing hand in hand with each other at that stage. I sort of said, he's ready to go. Um, I think Darren Baxter was the Ruck Rover at the time. You've got 
you're starting to build your own side. And with the way I am, I'm just going to get in the way of it. And I, I think that it's the right thing. That the Bulldogs have done everything right by me. I think it's the right thing for me to now step aside and let you guys sort of move on. So it was disappointing because I actually felt like I had a little bit more to uh, to give, but that season I didn't. So if I had been at Hawthorne at the time and they were successful, I could have taken 10 weeks off, tried right. to get yourself right, come back for finals, but that wasn't where the Bulldogs were at. You know? And that's so often with clubs where they're developing and it's the senior player. Do we need the senior player and don't we need the senior player? I was pleased that the club didn't come and pat me on the back. I was pleased that it was me that came and sort of said, it's my time. Well, well said, so, you know, 69 brilliant games and, you you know, you did it your way, as you say, and with a team first approach. So, you know, I, I, you know, I think there's no regrets there and that's just in keeping with everything you've said so far, Terry. Sorry, Paul, I cut you off there. Now, as I said to say, Terry, thanks, Matty, that Simon Atkins was really a model of yourself, wasn't he, in, in many respects? A very classy, uh, high handball type of player. Mm. So you certainly taught him well, Terry. Well, look, I think the one area when Axe first arrived was that he wasn't the fittest uh, young man going around, coming from uh, from Tassie. He's a bit lackadaisical. I mean, that's his, it was Simon's nature anyway. Brilliant kick of the football, magnificent user with, uh, with his hands. Uh, he had all the attributes. The one thing that I saw and that I, that I thought I could add to him is get him ultra fit. You know, I can remember for any of the people that used to go around, they have to be pretty old now, but uh, they used to go and come down and watch uh, trainings down at the uh, at the Western Oval at the time. We'd do all our trainings and then me, Axe, and a couple of others would just do uh, stride after stride. So we'd do laps of the ground, but stride the straights, jog the bends, stride the straights, jog the bends, just do extra, 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 extra. Then we'd go into the gym, we'd do seven, 800 sit-ups, uh, just to uh, continue to do the extras, just because I thought that was the one area. If he could get that right, he had he had all the other tools. So uh, and he got that right. He he got it. You know, he understood that that was what you needed to do if you were going to be a pro. Mm. So so here you are. Then you transition from you know being a player, and a lot of your teammates then became under your wing as a um, as an assistant coach and a Bulldogs reserves coach, and then eventually the senior coach. What was it like? You know, coaching some of the players who you had such a close relationship is that a challenge, or is it? Is it? Can you use that to your advantage when you become their coach? Uh, it's a challenge. I think it depends on what type of person you are. I, I, mean, I was a bit of a lad, so I was the one sort of you know, grabbing them every now and then. Yes, I was doing the hard work with them on the ground. I mean, I was always the old you know, play hard, play hard sort of you know, play hard on the on the field, play hard off the field. So when you've been that little bit of a lad. And then mm. you know, try to pin their ears back a little yes. bit. That's, that can get a little bit uh, conflicted <laughs> at, at times. So I'd be the first to put up my hand and sort of say that that, that was you know, a, li a little bit challenging uh, from that point of view. But I think I had enough brownie points up. I think I'd sort of shown you know, work ethic and, and uh, that, that they would take on board uh, the both. And yeah. certainly the younger blokes didn't know so much about with the past history, you, know, you didn't have to worry about that too much with the uh, with the younger lads coming through. Uh, but I look, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed working under under Wheels. Uh, I, obviously, then it was Alan Joyce uh, for for a period of time, and uh, um, yeah, the assistant coaching role. I mean, it was only really just developing then. I mean, we didn't have uh, full time staff. I was still working part time, so so I was so I was working full time. I should say I was working at Sky Channel, uh, which was out of GDV9 in Richmond, and then bolting down to the club and you know, getting things organised uh, to make sure we had uh, had training on board. So that was my assistant coaching time. Obviously, by the time uh, I got to senior coaching, all that had become uh, you know, a full-time program then. Terry, you were coaching the reserves. Who did you usher through? Who did you like in the reserves and who did you have an impact on that, that had some longevity at the club? Yeah, we won a flag. Um, so, I mean, those times, I think uh, Curly Austin might have won one, then we, I won one with the reserves, and I think David Noble is the other one to uh, to win one, probably over a span of about uh, 10 years, or you know, somewhere around that sort of time, 10 to 12 years. Uh, oh, we had some good kids. We had some really good kids. You know, 
kid by the name of Brad Johnson went pretty well. He was uh, he was one that uh, I quite liked that was in the side. We had a, another young man by the name of Luke Darcy, whose father had played a fair bit of football with the club. He was a, you know, a nice athlete. Had Rowan Smith coming through at, at the time. Uh, we had a guy who I thought had a, a bit of knowledge about the game who was playing. He was more of a senior player, but uh, went on to do all right for the club as well by the name of Luke Beveridge who played in that premiership uh, reserve side for me. So, no, there's, look, there was quite a few. Steve McPherson, uh, well, the two Tassie boys, uh, Simon Atkins and Steve McPherson actually both played in that uh, side. Both of them had had injuries during that particular year and had missed quite a few games and uh, and come back and dual captained uh, the side for uh, for that flag. So it was a good time. It was a nice balance between some of those senior boys who I had actually you know, played alongside of and uh, and obviously the uh, the juniors who you knew were going to become really good players for the future of the football club. Yeah, when you look back at that team photo of the 1994 Reserves Premiership team, it's it's a phenomenal one. And, you, you know, you've just rolled through some absolute legends of, um, of, of, um, of the club there. Um, so, Terry, you were, you know, you were the reserves coach and then... Um, you know, something obviously happened, you know, midway through the 96 season and um, and suddenly you were um, thrust into the, the driver's seat in um, in 96. Um, and you took us from, you know, I think it was uh, 15th and, and, you know, things, as you say, the worm turns and up we went the, the following year. Um, how was your first game as coach? Because it's, it's quite a famous game, I believe. Uh, the Collingwood match was, was your first match, right, where, um, where we, we, we just got beaten. Um, and, and there's some great footage of you, obviously leaving the field, um, year of the dog, and and going into the um, into the dugouts and and having a you know a, a really big spray at the club. Was it was it more about you asserting yourself, or was that about sort of setting culture and saying you know what we're better than a mediocrity that um, you know that maybe people have come to know us for? Yeah, setting culture was what it was all about. And I, I think anyone who actually has a listen to the speech and it wasn't planned. But I had in mind what we needed to do and just whether that was on a Monday, whether that was in two weeks' time. But, uh, yeah, when I first got to the club, I was always surprised about how we would get clapped off if we at half time if we were within two goals of one of the good sides. Yep. And I'd give them, well, we're, we're behind. We're, we're, not, we're not winning, but you've put in a good effort. Um, that always surprised me because that's not what I sort of come from and I think the team had lost its way a little bit in you know, the early part of the 96 season and was starting to become easy beats and it was just all getting a little bit too hard and I actually believed, well my first night as taking over as coach I actually wrote up on the whiteboards every achievement that every player on our list had done um, over the period of time, whether they'd won junior best and fairest, yeah. competition best and fairest, uh, you know, played in state games, played Teal Cup, uh, you know, blokes like Libba who had you know, won medals at under-19 levels and reserve levels of, of football, just put it all up there and sort of said, well, I don't know how, who, or where you see you got yourselves at, but this is who I see you as. Um, and... So that was the starting point, but we hadn't got there. And the, the particular, the game against Collingwood, we allowed them to kick seven of the easiest goals early in the game. And then we worked and worked and worked and worked. We beat them in the, the second quarter, third quarter and fourth quarter, yet we lost the game by two points. And my whole point was to have a go at them that like, it's just completely unacceptable that what we did in the first quarter, but, we are actually good enough to be very, very competitive in a very competitive competition if we play like, and we have the mindset to play like we played in the last three quarters. So it was, it was getting a point across and it started ferocious. I think it finished with, I'll see you back at the social club for a beer. So <laughs> I mean, it had a, sort of a balance of, uh, of both in it, but uh, yeah, it, it was not point scoring, but it was trying to sort of say, Come on, guys. You know, how many coaches are going to have to get sacked? How many times are we going to have to go through this? Where do you want to be as players in your own right? What do you want to stand for? It was sort of all those things parcel. Terry, I think I think David Parkin had a similar experience. I remember years ago when he coached Fitzroy after Hawthorne and 
he said he made an example and said, you know, if I ask the players at Fitzroy to run through the wall for me, some of them will get a ladder and climb over the top, some of them will slip around the side and some will try and go under. And he was making the point about the culture at the Fitzroy Football Club at the time, which I thought was quite humorous. Yeah, that, that's actually, that's a very good park, parkism. Um, yeah, look, I think our boys were uh, were with us, but they, I think they just lost their way. I think they had gone through uh, you know, a pretty tough six months where things weren't going well. And then we had, you know, obviously, a change of coach is never very easy in the uh, in the middle of a season. And how's all that going to work out? And is the bloke who's sort of in the seat at the moment, is he just sitting in the seat for you know, eight to ten weeks or is he going to be there next year? There's a lot that goes on in a player's mind. And I sort of said that 1989 season where I thought a lot of the players lost their way thinking about, you know, was the club going to survive? I think our boys in that uh, 96 season were in a very similar situation so it was just trying to get them back on the track and you know all running in the in the one direction again and I, I think we achieved it I mean we didn't I, I think I won three of ten to say oh I we as a as a group but uh, I think the record was three of ten in the back half of that year which doesn't sound great but we'd gone from losing by 70 points to the good sides in the first half of the year to running Collingwood to a kick Essendon in the last game of the year, we kick across the ground and lose the game on virtually the last kick in the, in the last game of the year. So we were starting to really compete against some really good sides without having the opportunity of taking them for a pre-season and, and building what I was hoping to sort of build with the boys sort of ongoing from there. Yep, absolutely. And then... Things turn very quickly and, you know, I guess some of that positive psychology and, you know, those, those high standards and expectations, um, you know, led us to, you know, back-to-back -back preliminary finals. It wasn't to be. And, you know, was, is 97 the one that sort of sticks out for you as one that got away? No doubt. I mean, no doubt. I mean, you can uh, you can mix it and mash it as much as what you want. And, uh, I only watched it. Somebody rang me. Uh, actually, might have been Mark Hunter that sent me a text and sort of saying, I hope you're not watching. And I said, well, as soon as you said that, now I'm going to turn it on. Uh, and I hadn't even sort of really thought about it in my own mind, but there was only 90 seconds to go. Mm. We were still in front by a couple of points, let's call it two points, with 90 seconds to go. We run into an open goal. If we kick the goal, back in those days, you put five behind the footy, it's game over. You know, they've got no possible chance of being able to kick two in the 90 seconds. We miss yeah. the unmissable goal, which was our fifth or sixth point. We kicked no goal six. It was the only second quarter for the whole year that we didn't kick a goal. You think it doesn't still affect me? Oh. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so we miss the goal. They take the ball end to end run it from one end of the ground down to the other end of the ground. You know, Jarman gets hold of the ball from the third or fourth for, his, for the quarter and kicks a goal and they hit the lead. We still have one last little opportunity with a bit of a, a scrimmage or a, a fumble around in the uh, in the goal square to have another opportunity. But if we kick that goal with 90 seconds to go, the game's over. So that's lost opportunity. I mean, that's something that's in your hands that you haven't grasped at the time. And the 0-6, I mean, I'll still say till today that I thought we tightened up as a as a team and as a club, and I take responsibility for that because I'm the senior coach at the time. I just thought that we tightened. They played with a bit more freedom because they were coming from behind and, you know, away from home, coming from behind, coming at us. They played with more of the freedom. We played like as if, oh, we've got to do this. Yeah. And I just think that that tightening made us miss goal opportunities that shouldn't have been missed, just just didn't allow us to play with the freedom that we played for most, most of the season. And uh, it was almost like the expectation just at the moment got a little bit too uh, too much. The year after, we just got annihilated. They just beat us in every aspect of the game. They beat us out of the middle. They were big, strong and, uh, and, and too good. And they went on and won it. Uh, and I like the only thing that I always sit there and sort of say we were beaten in both of those years by the eventual 
mm-hmm. premier. So, uh, yeah, we weren't far. We weren't far away. If the fixture works around another way, we might have, you know, met um, Adelaide in the grand final rather than getting knocked out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as Dougie said, you know, you were that close from being, you know, potentially a um, a bulldog premiership coach, and um, you know, if not for a, you know. An umpiring decision, you know, with a liver one, um, you know, or Jose hitting the post. It's just, it's a game of inches, isn't it? And sometimes they go your way and sometimes they don't. And, um, you know, it, 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 you know, I, 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 every Bulldog supporter has had nightmares up until 2016 and we were able to put that to bed. I hope you have been able to a tiny bit as well, Terry. And um, uh, But we thank you for, you know, your incredible contributions, both as a player and as a coach, because it's, um, you know, phenomenal. Well, I was at all four of the finals in 2016, uh, commentating the games. I got the most joy. Well, the premiership's always the most joy, but the, the prelim final victory to put all that, that to bed, you know, Rocket having you know, been in three, me in two, uh, you know, Mickey Molehouse, Terry Wheeler, you know, all those preliminary finals, when they won that game, that preliminary final, I thought they'd get the flag. I just really believed that, you know, at home with all the supporter base that they get there. Uh, to the Bulldog supporters watching, I've got my membership for this year. I'm up, I'm up and running. So uh, just thought I'd better let, let people know that I'm, I'm still on board. And I always sort of say I had 14 fantastic years at the Dogs, one very unfortunate week, uh, which is obviously when I left as a uh, as a coach. And, uh, yeah, that's all behind us now. But uh, certainly from my point of view, uh, people sort of say, you know, where's your, where's your love lie? And I you know, played my premierships at uh, Hawks. I played nine years at Hawthorne. I was involved with the Bulldogs for 14. Yep. So I was there longer than at uh, the time. My kids grew up as Bulldog supporters at, at the time. I'm a life member of the Doggies. I'm a Charlie Sutton medalist. Um, so I still love the club. That is music to our ears. And, you know, everybody sees you as a Bulldog First and foremost, I know, you know, you're a Hawthorne Premiership player, but you're a bulldog in our eyes, so thank you. Um, Terry, before we leave, we've got one more thing, and I'm conscious of time. Um, we've got uh, a final activity that we do just to send off our guests, and it's a um, it's a bulldog quiz um, where we put 60 seconds on the clock. Now, I'm putting you, un- you know, without any um, pre-notice here, so I apologise, right. but you love a bit of pressure, which is, right. which is your style. So I'm going to give you a little bit of power. You can choose the topic. It's either off-season headlines at the Bulldogs, so off-seasons, um, or player names starting with W, all right, i.e. Wallace. Oh. You can choose. Uh, no, I'll go to player names and see how we go. Now, Matty, if we... Uh, Terry, just very quickly, Matty, who's on top of the list? Because it's a little bit like uh, the, 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 uh, the automobile, the car program in England... Um, which name top escapes year. me at the moment? Correct. And yeah. who's on? Who's sitting on top, Matty? There it is, there on the screen. So Dougie Hawkins at the top, Ray uh, Walker, Clay Smith, Simon Beasley, Terry. You're going to climb somewhere. Hopefully, you'll fifth that worse at this stage. So let's see well, how you go. Doug, okay. Doug lived at the joint, so he's he's going to be hard to beat. <laughs> All right. So you've got 60 seconds on the clock. Time starts now. True or false? Terry is the father of Mitch Wallace. True or false? False. Nikki Winmar wore the number one Guernsey in 1999. True or false? True. Correct. Uh, true or false, Ted Whitten Jr. and Senior play the most combined father-son games for the Dogs. Oh, i say true. It is true. Which W was the leading goal kicker in the club in 1996? Uh, Jason. Jason Watts. Jason Watts. You got it. Well done. Which W was the Bulldog uh, 2016 Premiership captain? Premiership captain player. starting with W. Back pocket player. <laughs> uh, Easter Wood. Well done. Which W won the most club best and fairest? Ooh. Uh, Scott West. Yay. Um, how many games did Mark West play in total? Oh, God, I've got no idea. I'll say <laughs> 46. Oh, stop there. 46 is your final answer? Yeah, I Believe it or idea. not, 16 games, Terry. Is that all? Jeez. It felt like a heck of a lot more. I know you coached Amazing. him; he was an incredible player. Um, but you know, you know what? What a beast of a player, and to only play sixteen games for the club. Well, that ninety-seven uh, preliminary final, I think, was the best game that he ever played for the club. Incredible, incredible. Now, well done. Your scores are coming up on the screen right now.
There they are, Terry. Well done. Oh, well, no, look, I mean, Hawks always hard to beat, but uh, at least we had a crack. Just, Indeed, just thinking about your attitude, though, Terry, no doubt you're probably prepared, did you? I know that you did a bit of extra work, as you said, <laughs> prior to this. Uh, I'm not quite sure that I had – I didn't have a little book here. I didn't have my phone, so uh, <laughs> I just did it all off the top of the head. I can't believe it took me about eight seconds to get East of Wood out. Gee, that's yes, was... very disappointing. I, I'm, still, I'm still used to Bobby Murphy being the captain. Well, you got it in the end, Terry, question. and um, and we're fortunate to have gotten you. Um, so, from the bottom of our hearts, we want to thank you, Terry Wallace, for um, for for everything you've contributed to the club, and um, thank you so much for being part of Inside the Kennel podcast. A pleasure. It was my pleasure to be on, and I uh, hope people get some enjoyment out of having this. Thanks, Terry. No worries at all. Red in my heart, white in my veins, blue in my eye, red, white, and blue in my brain. I'm a